Those of us who are alive today are about to live through the most consequential period in the history of humanity. Now that sounds like an exaggeration to say that when you consider the long arc of history and everything that humanity has faced, but it isn't an exaggeration. We have left dealing with the climate crisis so late that unless we are able to reduce emissions by fully 50% by 2030, we will have lost the opportunity to manage this systemic risk with all of the implications that will have for future generations and for the planet. We already know that we have probably passed the tipping points for summer Arctic sea ice and for the coral reefs and that we are likely to lose most of the coral reefs around the world. Either we get on top of this now or those will simply be early warning signs of the transformations and the degradations that will happen on our watch. Now, if you're like most people, then as I was explaining that, you will have felt a small contraction of fear inside you, a sense of, we're not gonna make it, it's too late. What will my life be like? What will the life of my children be like? That is an entirely understandable response. And it leads to a very interesting question. What type of reaction to that data is most helpful in enabling us to deal effectively with the challenge that we now face? Fear plays a role. Fear wakes us up. It stops us from being complacent and it makes us focus on the challenge and what we now need to do. So we need to be clear about that. We need to be honest about the facts and understand the scale of the challenge. But at that point, fear stops being so relevant. It's hard to sustain it. It doesn't lead to constructive action. I have argued in my career, as well as my friend and co-author and colleague Christiana Figueres, that we need to face this moment with a sense of stubborn and realistic but determined optimism. Often in history, what we see is that that sense of determination and stubborn optimism, which is not based on a form of wishful thinking, but it's to do with facing the darkness and the reality and holding that determination like a torch in the darkness with a deep courage and a deep determination to do everything that's possible while we still can to precipitate the change. That has often been what has created transformations in history. The stubborn optimism is not the result of success, it is the cause of it. And in my own experience, in the creation of the Paris Agreement, that's what I saw. That's how this change happened. The stubborn optimism, the attitude emerged, and in the end, that crashed over us as a wave of momentum and delivered the outcomes in a way we probably couldn't have delivered if we'd been down in the weeds trying to deal with the pessimism and the challenge. So, Stubborn optimism is not about a form of wishful thinking. However, it's also not an irrational response. If you look at the world right now and you understand what's going on, then you can see that actually we are transforming much faster than it might first appear. It's very difficult for us as human beings to understand exponential change and what that means in our world. But we've all just had a lesson in that from the global pandemic that is COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic has indeed been exponential. And what we've all learned as the amateur epidemiologists that we've become is that it matters much less what the number of cases are at any one minute. What matters more is the growth rate, the spread rate, and in particular, the doubling rate. Just to give you an example, if only 10 people had COVID today, but the doubling rate was two days, the entire world population could be infected inside two and a half months. That is what exponential growth is. And it's hard for us to get our heads around it. We intuitively think that the future will be a linear progression from the past. And we fall into that trap time and time again. Now, that's an example of exponential growth hurting us. But there are also lots of examples where exponential growth can really make a positive difference. Take solar power, for example. Right now, solar power constitutes about 3% of the global energy mix of the production and generation of electricity. Now you could look at that number and say 3% after decades of innovation and investment, that clearly is not going to lead to an outcome and to an amount of solar that is gonna make a material difference to our lives in anything like a timescale that will help us deal with the climate crisis. However, look at it a different way. That 3%, solar is now on a trajectory to double less than two years. 
So you only have to project that forward into the future with an exponential rate of growth, which is the rate it's been growing at, to see that three to six, six to 12, 12 to 24 and on, actually will lead to a complete transformation of those systems inside very small time periods, like five or 10 years. And when you, com when you compare that and you add in the tr growth trajectories of wind and other types of renewables, you'll see that we are on the cusp of a change that we have not seen in generations. This goes again and again for multiple different solutions to the climate crisis. Solar, wind, other renewables, but also electric vehicles are now doubling less than every two years. Hydrogen as a fuel for trucking is also growing at a remarkable rate, albeit from a lower base. And in the next few years, we will see that precipitate remarkably. It's not just the commit. It's not just the growth in those types of technologies either. We're also seeing similar growth in commitments. Just a year ago, there were less than 100 companies committed to net zero. Now it's well over 1,000. Similar growth rates we've seen for cities, investors, all types of other stakeholders in society. Right now, the world is waking up to this. The commitments are spreading around the world. And why is this happening? It's happening, of course, because we finally aligned the economics with the climate solutions. Renewables are now the cheapest form of new power in most places around the world. Electric vehicles are now the cheapest form of transportation if you look at the full cost of ownership and the cost of purchasing the vehicle is now almost at parity in many parts of the world already. These are all remarkably good stories and they are grounded reasons why we can feel optimistic about the future that we're now facing. But so far I've talked about technology. And technology is the heart of what we're talking about here. However, it's not how this change will happen. This is about a human transformation. This is about human beings changing the way we live, understanding what this transformation is, aligning, yes, economics with climate strategy, but also then changing our behavior and changing the systems of how we organize our lives. And that needs to happen in democracies for the most part. Climate change is fundamentally unfair. It's unfair geographically, it's unfair economically, it's unfair generationally. It's been created by people who look like me. And it's a legacy of historical colonialism and extraction and a way of thinking that now needs to change. The technology will help us, but we also need to take this moment to bring forward a deeper sense of equality and a realization that we are all in this together. If climate change exacerbates or compounds existing inequalities, between races, between genders, between generations, then we will never make the transformations we need to make. This is our moment to make those changes. So in a sentence, you can sum up where we are on climate by saying, we have come further than we thought was possible in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was adopted, but we still haven't gone far enough. The next 10 years are critical. They are definitional for the future of the planet. When Christiana Figueres and I left the United Nations, we chose to create an organization and call it Global Optimism. There is a natural alignment between that and it is an enormous privilege to have been here at the Earth Optimism Conference and to share some of these perspectives. I really wish you the best for the next few days and for these discussions. I love that you are taking this perspective and choosing to make it a cornerstone of action to transform the world. We should all celebrate this wild opportunity of the difference we can make. We should be grateful for it and we should ride out to meet it. Let's make it count.